This is WBAA. I'm Mike Lowitzo. Purdue University Press is recently out with a book. The title is Engineering and Social Justice in the University and Beyond. The book is aimed at engineering academics worldwide who are attempting to bring social justice into their work and practice or who would like to but don't know where to start. Joining me to talk about the book is one of its editors. Alice Pauley is an assistant professor in the School of Engineering Education at Purdue and an affiliate faculty member in the university's Women's Studies program. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. Let's start with why a book on engineering and social justice. So there are a couple of small reasons, and then there's a big reason, a couple of big reasons. Small reasons, there's an increasing interest among engineers, among engineering students and engineering educators on making a more deliberately positive impact on the world. Um, There's an increase in the number of national and international reports that are focused on um, a reshaping and rethinking of engineering and engineering education in light of social justice-like concerns. Um, And there's a need for talking about what's forming as pretty innovative um, research in the area. Um, And there there are only a few places that one can publish on engineering and, and social justice. So there's a journal, there's a conference, and now we have a book. But really, there are big reasons. Um, oh, and one, one other small reason I should add. Um, our school head, Kamyar Haigigi, um, felt that thinking about and researching engineering and engineering education shouldn't be done in a vacuum, um, and that we can't just improve the efficiency and effectiveness of engineering, of educating engineers, without concerning ourselves with what we're teaching students and and how they should be in the world or could be in the world. So the big reasons are that engineers have had a role in creating a lot of the social problems that we have, um, including economic and income inequity, um, including resource use, which drove things like colonization um, and which drives a lot of the major geopolitical issues that we have today. Climate change being another huge thing that engineers contributed to um, with sociopolitical and ecological consequences. So that's not to say that engineers haven't also done a ton of good things. um, And it's not to say that engineers are the only people who've contributed to major problems um, that require thinking about justice. Um, But if engineers want to help solve them and if engineers sort of construct themselves as people who solve problems, as so many of us do, Um, then we need to understand how engineering also helped create them. And so this work in engineering and social justice more broadly helps us reflect critically on our practice as engineers and as engineering educators, and then think about what that means for how we teach students to become professional engineers in the future. Um, I guess the other thing is that we think that engineers should take responsibility for addressing those problems that they helped create, And in so doing, they can learn about the complexity of the systems that they helped um, um, develop and that influence their everyday work um, so that we can increase justice and, oh my gosh, happiness and all kinds of good things in the world as well, um, rather than just decreasing it. And amongst those whom engineers don't often think about as the subjects of engineering. So how do we help students, so the focus of this is on engineering um, and social justice in the university starting place. So how do we help students think about um, their practice and role as future engineers and as people who will construct this thing called engineering potentially as a more socially just discipline? Um, Yeah. And I guess the last thought is that engineering is too powerful an entity to be not included in conversations about justice and social justice. Um, And their problems are too big to not use the work and expertise and power that engineers have in trying to solve them. So it's a sort of two-way equation. How do we as engineers try to improve the world in intentionally just ways um, and do so critically and reflexively? And then how do we participate in people who are already trying to do these things? When you were a student, I mean, was this something that came up in, in classes in the university setting? Or, huh. or is this something more just more recent that you all in academia have, have experienced or, or noticed? Well, my, my colleagues have a longer history of working on this than I do. Um, when I was an undergrad, I, I vaguely knew that 
that engineers would have a job at the end of college. Um, and I wasn't even aware that, for example, that women were so underrepresented in engineering. Um, I went to school in Canada at McGill University uh, in chemical engineering, and we were almost half-half. So I wasn't even aware of the sort of demographic participation in my own classroom, let alone um, what sort of impacts engineers could have on the world. <laughs> I did go into my undergraduate program wanting to um, solve environmental problems. So I had that knowledge. Um, but it wasn't until the middle of my third year of undergrad that I suddenly realized that, in fact, faculty aren't usually taught how to teach, and that seemed wrong. Um, and that led me into thinking about engineering education. And then I had a colleague who recommended I take a women's studies class, which was the biggest eye-opening experience I have ever had intellectually. And that set me down the path around, around social justice, not just that the sort of the topics of engineering could be socially just, but how they went about doing their work as engineers or how they even thought about the world could have implications for and around oppression. I had never thought of that. Now, that being said, my colleagues have uh, – my co-editor colleagues and then the authors – um, have longer histories of social activism, of uh, participating in public engagement of science and engineering. Um, so I, I would say it, it varies, but there's now a name. Engineering and social justice is a, is a concept that people put together and search on, and there are journals with it. And so it's, I wouldn't say it's new, but it has certainly developed a critical mass. That was going to be one of my questions in the profession outside of the university setting. Is this being embraced or, I mean, is this something where they're saying, oh, yeah, social justice? I mean, what's sort of the, the take of it in the professional societies and whatnot? Uh, it's a good question. Not so much that I know of. Um, I, I should restate. I don't know so much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I know – so one of the aspects of this book – is that there are lots of definitions of social justice. There's spectra of definitions, and that's multidimensional spectra. Um, and I would say that, you know, there are environmental engineering firms that consider sustainability more or less or consider community engagement in, in the solutions that they're generating or um, – uh, different reactions to uh, relationships with the public. And we might place them in different places on the social justice scale. That doesn't mean that they would identify or not identify as doing work that's socially just. Um, I guess to each his own, so to speak. Right. And, but I'm, I'm hoping that our work and the, the work of other academics and the work of other sort of critical researchers, and that's a, sort of small C critical. There's basic research, how do we understand the world that we live in? There's applied research, what do we do with that knowledge to improve our human condition? And critical research helps us reflect on whether those things are how we want to be in the world. Like, are those the right things to be doing, those ethical questions or, or so forth? Through this critical research, um, I think we're hoping to shift that spectrum to be closer to what we hope is as an ideal of, of social justice, that in the practice, the subject um, and the, the solutions of engineering can be more socially just in a much more deep sense than a superficial sense. So to each his own. But there are, 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 there are ideals that we strive for. Um, and we don't want to just sort of let folks say, oh, yeah, it's socially just, check. Yeah. So I guess it's the nature of the beast that we be self-reflective about, is this as just as we can be? Can we improve this? And there will not be a, a point also on the other end where we're like, oh, okay, now I'm doing everything. Check on that end as well. Continuum. That's right. <laughs> so the book has three sections in a teaching, research, and engagement. What are engineering students taught about social justice right now? Good question. Most of them explicitly, not a lot. 
Um, implicitly, this means that they are learning that social justice doesn't matter in how they practice to be engineers. So we talk about problems that they should solve completely stripped of context or in the context of industrial or commercial settings without thinking about other contexts that one could practice engineering uh, in light of socially just concerns. So students explicitly tend to be taught about um, what scum scholars are calling microethics, which is making sure that your individual practice of an, as, as an engineer is legal and professionally sound um, and that you make sort of ethical good decisions. And they don't have a lot of conception about a bigger picture situating their practice as engineers in a bigger macroethical picture um, and their role as practitioners in reproducing that bigger picture. Um, so examples. Um, so most examples that engineering students see in their day-to-day -day classes are in projects and so forth come from these industrial or commercial contexts. So they start to think that engineering is about solving problems in commercial and industrial contexts. Um, and they tend to be ones solve it, solved in first world high tech contexts. Um, they don't really think about how engineering can be applied to solving problems of marginalized communities, um, communities that can't pay for engineering labor, um, or that the solving of the problems aren't themselves focused on paid labor. There's always a connection with this will be your professional job for which you will be paid. They, it doesn't really occur to them. They could do engineering pro bono or on, on um, uh, along with community members or teaching others about engineering practice as just part of who they are. So this is actually proving more and more problematic to lots of students who want to make a positive dis difference in the world and they see this industrial and commercial context as being somewhat complicit in problematic or oppressive structures. They don't want to um, be people who go and make huge amounts of profit to the detriment of communities. They don't want to be the ones who cause sort of untold ecological harm to people who have no recourse to communities other than themselves. Um, they want to be part of a bigger, a bigger thing that makes the world a better place. Uh, we, we talk about a phrase, actually, engineers can make a world of difference. And usually that's in an aspirational way and not a equally valid and scary problematic way as well. So how do we reach those students then who want to make a world of difference in a good sense, having stripped all context from the examples that they see in class. So instead, let's rethink how we teach them the subjects of engineering, the context in which they care about the building of the widget. Um, so in our first year engineering class that we teach here at, at Purdue, um, we have an example not just of a, uh, create some kind of widget, but instead how do you create a device that um, makes peanut butter for a women's co-op in Haiti that's been impacted by the earthquake. And that puts a whole bunch more reality, but also community face and context to a problem that all of a sudden becomes a better, more thoughtful engineering problem to solve, a better learning experience for the students, and one that has questions about social justice at their heart. It's like you're almost sneaking it in there. Not to be using sneaky as a, as a negative term, but... Might as well. Yeah. I mean, the, one could say that otherwise we're sneaking in that engineers only work in industry or they only work in commercial context. And engineers are work in law. They work as public school teachers. They work in government. They, they you know, work as volunteers in the community. They, all, they do all kinds of things. Um, and so I, I think it's more a balancing with a little more reality um, and allowing the space to be more diverse for them. The, their potential selves can go in more places. Give me an idea, uh, one or two topics or, or instances that you can think of, of research going on now in this subject. What are some of the big things, quote unquote? Um, let's see. <laughs> Outside of the book? <laughs> yeah. 
the, the book I- includes several cases, research uh, studies. Right, right. Um, well, so, and, and the book really, so the book has three, this, these three sections teaching uh, research and engagement that sort of models the different types of work of an academic, right? Or at least an, an American academic. Um, but all of the work in there is research. So one huge area has to do with looking at the relationship between engineers and um, who they are designing for. And some people call that user-centered design. Some people call that human-centered design. There are lots of different terms around that. But how we, as engineers, do better engineering with diverse or marginalized communities um, around service learning, around problem-based learning. I would say that's a big area. Um, Questions around that. How do you um, set students up who are often from fairly privileged backgrounds, they're at college, um, understand the issues and concerns and needs of people who are much lower down in the class scale scale from them, may be very different ethnically um, or have different family structures or different nationalities involved. So how do you how do you actually help students learn from working with diverse communities at the same time without setting up very problematic relationships with the communities themselves? The communities need something. And students don't necessarily do that very well, <laughs> fill their needs. And so how do you balance the needs between the students trying to learn something from a, a some kind of service learning experience, working with actual people, and the community members who need that thing? So that's that's a sort of big area. And, and how do we teach students um, to learn from community members um, or users of some kind of some product or process um, in thoughtful, sensitive, informed, complex ways. So that that's one area. I mentioned that there were, was basic applied and critical research. I think there is a big critical area where different researchers are reflecting on different aspects of the practice of engineering and how um, those philosophically align with who we say we are or uh, reproduce inequality or oppression or um, are complicit with strange power structures that we might not appreciate or contribute to more problems than they help solve. That's a big bucket. Um, And I think that there's also a big area around access inequality. That is to say... um, in engineering education, we know that we have small numbers of women and of people of color. Um, we also have small numbers of people who are of, in, in lower class um, statuses, and I, I think that's broader than just socioeconomic status. Um, but how do we how do we investigate the structure of engineering education so that it actually can be for as many people? Um, as who would like to become engineers in the future. So there's sort of questions about representation, about whose problems, um, let me step back from that, questions about um, how do we structure education in ways to um, uh, interest diverse audiences, and meet the needs of diverse audiences. So I guess there's a sort of big area associated with that, which is, I would say, comes under social justice in different ways. Speaking about women, is the underrepresentation issue exclusive to the United States? It really varies. I mean, okay. it is not at all a U.S. problem or even a Canadian problem. <laughs> um, it, but it does vary. There are some places where... Um, the representation of women to men in engineering programs is much nearer parity than it is in the U.S. Um, they're in educational contexts. Usually, once that goes into um, employment context, the numbers drop again. 
Um, so, and in very surprising places, there are equal numbers of women in Middle Eastern countries and so forth in some contexts. There are also technical universities for women in some of those places, which is pretty awesome, along with my colleague um, Donna Riley is at Smith, which is a women's college, which has the first engineering program at a women's college in the country and is the first ABET accredited um, engineering bachelor's degree program. I think it's at a women's college, not just a liberal arts college. I think it's, I think it's at a women's college. Anyway, um, the, that being said, one of the issues that concerns us, uh, me in particular, um, is that the rate at which women are going into engineering in the U.S. is actually decreasing. So we still keep getting more and more women each year, but if we keep going at the same rate, we're not going to get to 50%. And so something else needs to happen for us to um, equally represent our general population um, in our engineering population. And my current theory is that we have lots of work trying to investigate, you know, women themselves, um, reduce sexism, reduce um, un implicit and unconscious bias in recruiting, retaining, teaching um, women. Um, but it's not working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, or not to, not to the extent that we would expect it for the amount of effort that we're putting in. So that's where my research comes in. So I'm the editor of the book, a co-editor of the book, but also an author. And I think that we could construct this thing called engineering to take a focus and an interest in the problems that have historically been those of women, and which in much of the rest of the world still are the problems of women. Um, and until we do that, until we make engineering a more socially just discipline in terms of gender, a less gendered discipline, uh, we shouldn't wonder why women aren't wanting to participate in it. And this is the same for people of color and same for people um, of poorer classes. So women are underrepresented in the U.S. We are not alone, but we need to do some stuff differently, I think, if we're going to solve this problem. And one of the um, stories, for lack of a better term, one of the research studies in the engagement section talks about the community college and how they are sort of their own social experiment, bringing in underrepresented students, many you know, first-time college students in their family, and how that pipeline from the community college then gets into the university, the four-year university. I, I thought that was interesting. And, and, you know, you often think about the men to women disparity, but not necessarily the minority. Right, right. Uh, do you mean the minority case in the context of engineering? Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and those things overlap because we have gendered and raced economic systems. Um, and so you'll see a much more diverse population. Or if we took um, what we would currently look at as our, our typical engineering population at a four-year college, um, we might have in undergraduates about 20% um, women, 80% men. We might have um, 6 to 10% underrepresented minorities. Particular groups of, of people of color, including black and African-American students, Hispanic and Latino students, Native American, Pacific Islander students, um, not including Asian students usually. Um, because they're not underrepresented compared to the general population. But we take that sort of recipe that we commonly see at the four-year college, and then we look at a community college, mostly women, huge numbers in comparison of people of color, lots of people who can't afford the tuition at a four-year college, who need to be part-time students, who need um, flexibility with their course schedules because they have kids and families. Um, Absolutely, we need to be thinking about better ways. If we care about diversity in engineering education, we need to be thinking about how to connect better with community colleges because the structure of our educational institutions influences who can be successful in them. And actually, I have huh, different research where I try to understand how institutional structure can support the lived experiences of diverse students 
So if you're if you're trying to create an educational experience for a student who is um, oh, 18 to 24 um, white dude, um, you probably end up with some place like Purdue. But if you're trying to look for someone who's 35, has a part-time job and two kids, um, and is maybe a single parent, you structure your institution really differently. So even the buildings and the structure of classes and our expectations of what happens in those classes can influence who becomes an engineer. And that is totally relevant for thinking about um, diversity issues in, in engineering. So I'm so glad that our contributors brought in um, class, in this case, and, and, and different educational structures into this book, um, because I think it provides a lot of uh, new things for thought, new ideas for thought, and um, fodder for rethinking our, our institution's structures to become more just. The book is Engineering and Social Justice in the University and Beyond from Purdue University Press. Alice Pauley, along with Caroline Bailey and Donna Riley, are the editors. For more information, you can go online to thepress.purdue.edu. You're listening to WBAA. I'm Mike Lowitzow.